Welcome to the first subtopic, the wave behaviour of light, of our final topic, light and atoms, for stage two physics. And in this first video, part A of this subtopic, we're going to look at electromagnetic waves. Now, electromagnetic waves are the UV radiation that causes a sunburn. They are the visible light that our eyes can contact, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. They also make up the infrared, which is what our remote controls for our TVs work on. They also then go down into the area of the what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, where um, radio and television signals are transmitted, and also what our mobile phones and our Wi-Fi and all those sort of things use to transmit information. So really, really important part of physics. Let's get into it. Okay. Let's start off, um, as we often do, by looking at what is the, um, what the SACE board says we need to know or what is the learning intention for this part of the course. So oscillating charges produce electromagnetic waves of the same frequency as the oscillation. Electromagnetic waves cause charges to oscillate at a frequency of the wave. We'll talk about that in a sec. Use the frequency of oscillation of the electrons in the transmitting and receiving antenna to explain the transmission and reception of radio or television signals. We'll go through that. Electromagnetic waves are transverse waves made up of mutually perpendicular oscillating electric and magnetic fields. We'll talk about that. And we need to relate the orientation and receive relate the orientation of the receiving antenna to the plane of polarization of radio or television waves. And I'll go through that, but I'm also going to talk about another example of polarization which we can just very neatly demonstrate within the flipped lesson. So, what do we need to know? An accelerating charged particle radiates electromagnetic waves. So, by accelerating here, we just basically mean, really think of this as changing direction. So if we've got an alternating current or an alternating electric field here in a transmitting antenna, as that oscillates positive, negative, positive, negative, that's going to make the electrons in the antenna go up and down, up and down, up and down. That oscillation, or that acceleration or oscillation of the electrons will produce an electromagnetic wave. The frequency, so the number of oscillations per second of the electromagnetic wave will be exactly the same as the frequency of the oscillating um, electric field or the oscillating charge. So electromagnetic waves exist and basically can continue and propagate through space because a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field and a changing electric field produces a changing magnetic field and so on. So we talked about in the last topic the idea of um, being able to generate um, magnetic fields through moving charges or through moving magnetic fields to be able to generate electric fields. And what that looks like in an electromagnetic field is, as the electric field strength changes, it produces a magnetic field at 90 degrees to it. As that magnetic field changes, it produces an electric field. And so on and so on. So it basically becomes this self-propagating wave that will travel through space. The elect an electric magnetic wave in a vacuum consists of oscillating mutually perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. So that's basically just what I said, but noting that, and in the same way as it happens with um, in the previous topic, the electric field and the magnetic field are always perpendicular to each other. The electric and magnetic fields oscillate at right angles to the direction of travel of the electromagnetic wave. The wave is therefore transverse. So in year 11, we would have talked about... Um, longitudinal and transverse waves. The key thing about a transverse waves is that the, we would say, in, if it was a mechanical wave, we would say the particles vibrate at 90 degrees. So the electric and magnetic fields vibrate at 90 degrees to the direction that the wave front is traveling. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's a bit like the example of waves on the ocean. The, the water goes up and down, if you like, and the energy transfer is transferred across the ocean at perpendicular to the direction of those water particles are vibrating. Strictly speaking, water waves are also partly longitudinal, but 
that it's very easy to, they're easiest to picture them just as, um, as transverse waves. Now, the plane of polarization of an electric magnetic wave is the plane defined by the direction of travel of the oscillating electric field. So if we wanted to define the electric field here, we would, uh, if we wanted to find the plane of polarization here, it's the direction that the electric field is oscillating. And finally, the frequency of the radiated electromagnetic waves is the same as the frequency of oscillation of the source of change. Sorry, I actually already said that. So whatever the frequency of this is, is the same frequency as the electromagnetic wave. So whatever the frequency of the oscillating charge is, the bit I wanted to add, which is what I thought that last point was going to say, is when this electromagnetic signal hits a receiving antenna, it will cause the electrons in this receiving antenna to oscillate with the same frequency as the electric field. Therefore, we will get a signal that basically is the same as that signal that originally generated that oscillating electric charge that generated the electromagnetic wave that when it strikes and receiving antenna um, generates an, ex an, an identical signal there. And then say, if it's our radio, that our radio then converts this signal back into a sound wave that it plays through the speakers. So our transmitted signal from our transmitting antenna will be basically the same as our received signal at our receiving antenna. Now, this FET simulation here, a very simple one, but gives you just a really good sort of picture of this sort of, a good understanding of this sort of picture here, and I highly recommend you go and have a look at that FET simulation. So now I just want to talk a little bit more about polarisation. Um, if generally we need our receiving antenna to be in the same polarisation as our transmitting antenna. And if you just walk around wherever you live and visit some towns next to you, you'll be able to see this. If you have vertical polarisation, and TV is the classic example, it sort of simulates a UHF TV antenna that you would see um, anywhere around Australia. Um, if you have a, those signals are generated vertically, then you need to have your receiving antenna vertically. If they're generated horizontally, then your receiving antenna needs to be horizontal. Now, the reason that they use both is this minimises interference from areas that are close to each other. So if you're generating vertical signals, they could potentially interfere with other areas close by, but if they're in a horizontal, you're not going to get a very strong oscillation in the in the horizontal direction because these, um, yeah, the vertical one is going to have the signal going like that. So if the aerial is pointing at 90 degrees to that, you're not going to get um, a very strong signal picked up by that antenna. So I know in Tumby Bay, we have vertical orientation. If you go to Port Lincoln, I think they have horizontal orientation. And that's basically because those two towns are about 50 kilometres apart. And that just minimises the interference between the two signals. Um, the other way that you can look at that is, and think about polarisation, is just through um, thinking about what happens with a pair of polarised sunglasses. It's a very similar phenomena. Um, and I'm just going to put in now a really short, or oh, a short video that explains polarisation in terms of um, Polaroid filters or um, sunglasses as we commonly use them. Okay, let's play Now You See Me, Now You Don't. I have here two pair of Polaroid sunglasses, two pair of Polaroid sunglasses. If I hold one of those over the camera, basically they'll only let through, and let's just hypothetically say they're only going to let through the vertically polarised light. So you see it looks darker through the sunglasses because some of that light has been removed. Now if I bring in the second set of sunglasses and put over them, it's a little bit darker, but you can still see me because both of those lenses are letting through, let's just hypothetically say, the vertically polarised light. However, if I turn this one 90 degrees, now I disappear. And as you see, as I twist it back, I come back. And that's because if the first pair here are only letting through the vertically polarised light, 
this second pair are only going to let through now the, um, the horizontally polarised light, and all the horizontally polarised light has been taken out. Only vertical is getting through the first lens, so that's why I basically disappear until we bring those back in the same orientation. So that just shows the polarisation of light. Um, a similar thing happens with electromagnetic signals um, used to transmit um, television and other, inf other um, information. So in this last bit of the electromagnetic waves video, we are going to look at the wave equation. And I'm also briefly just going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, which isn't explicitly mentioned in the course, but I think is very important to understand. So, the speed of, oops, let me get my, the speed of a wave, its frequency and its wavelength are related through the formula V equals F lambda. We call this here the wave equation generally. Um, and it is a, an equation that you need to know and that we will use at um, a little bit this year. So when we talk about this, we're talking about the wave equation. Hopefully um, you are introduced to this in year 10 as well. Um, I think, not that it's super important, but just so you can see where this comes from, um, frequency is measured in well, velocity equals frequency is measured per second. It's the waves per second, so it's one over time. Um, frequency equals one over time is another way that we calculate frequency or the units for time are seconds. And lambda is the wave length, so it's the, um, the distance between two peaks or two crescents in a wave, and that's measured in meters. So you can see there, 1 on s times by m equals m s, which is basically equal to meters per second. Um, so that's, if you like, where that wave equation comes from. Um, I think it just sort of helps to understand that. Now, for electromagnetic waves, at least when they are in a vacuum, they will travel at the, what we call the speed of light c which is 3 times 10 to the 8 metres per second, so 300 million metres per second. Um, electromagnetic waves in a trans medi transparent medium travel at a speed v, which is less than c, where v equals f lambda. We've talked about that already. So we don't do a lot on that this year. Generally, we do just, just c and the speed of light in a vacuum. However, if you did anything last year on refractive index, Basically, refractive index is actually a measure of how much light slows down in an object. So the higher the refractive index, the lower the speed of light in that object. If you haven't done that, that doesn't matter. But if you have done that, that sort of helps you build on that. So, you know, typically you'll get asked to relate the speed, the frequency, well, given two of the three, so given either the speed, the frequency, or the wavelength, or two of those, you'll be needed to rearrange that formula and calculate the third. We also use it um, when we look at photons in combination with another equation. We'll come to that later. But it's generally pretty straightforward stuff. It's a three-term equation. I would hope everyone in stage three physics is fairly comfortable with um, using a three-term equation. Now, I just wanted to briefly um, mention the electromagnetic spectrum. I've already sort of hinted at this earlier on. Um, basically, we can look at electromagnetic waves and if we go this way we have increasing energy this way we have increasing frequency um, the other thing that we might like to also consider is what happens I'm sorry increasing wavelength is what happens with frequency and we can tell by rearranging this equation frequency equals c on lambda now generally the speed of light is a constant so we would say the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So as we get an increasing wavelength in this direction, we get a decreasing frequency. So that as we increase the wavelength, we decrease the frequency. Um, or going the other way, as we increase the frequency, we increase the energy. And we'll talk about the relationship 
um, where that's described when we do the photons topic later on. Um, in terms of our spectrum, as I hinted at in the, or as I talked briefly about in the, in the introduction to this video, we have, let's start at the low energy end, we have our AM and FM and our TV signals. We would also have uh, things like uh, Wi-Fi signals and all that. They are all fairly long wavelength, um, fairly, um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, relatively low frequency, relatively long wavelength, um, relatively low energy. All of our radio waves, our radar, TV, FM, AM, Wi-Fi, all of that stuff is down this end of the spectrum. As we move to the slightly more energetic, we get infrared. Um, infrared is what our remote controls for our TV use. Infrared is also what we experience at heat. But when we experience heat, we are experiencing very, very, very high intensity infrared. That's why we can get warmth and, and energy from that. As we go past infrared, we get into the part of the spectrum that our eyes can detect. So this tiny little bit in here is what we call visible light. That's what our eyes can detect. And that goes through red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy Jabiv, you might remember, as we get increasing energy. When we get past the visible part, we get into the ultraviolet. That's the sort of radiation that causes sunburn. Um, so it helps us remember that's relatively high energy. If we go beyond ultraviolet, we get into x-rays. They have even more energy. They're able to penetrate through skin and tissue to, say, give images of our bones. And if we go beyond that, we get into the gamma rays, which are released by radioactive elements. We would have looked at those in stage one and some of the, well, hopefully, some of the, the dangers of dealing with um, radiation and that high energy radiation. Again, not a significant part of the course this year, but I think it's just good to put all that stuff into perspective to see where it fits overall. Thanks for watching.